gentlemen, in order to fully understand today's debate, we need to really examine what is religion. We see a side proposition that understands that religion is something that cannot tangibly be proven. And yet people cling to it. People believe in it. It's, some, it's the center of some people's lives. People who have this faith in something that they cannot actually prove are very, very attached to that religion. And it's to that degree, and it's because of that, that we understand these people will be swayed by their religious um, leaders. They will be swayed in a way that we don't think is fair, and we think it actually eliminates some of their freedom of choice. So we'll be getting more into that. We'll be talking about this throughout the case. The extension we'll be presenting to you today will be about the war of religion and how it turns politics into a war on religion or of religions instead of a war of pol political stances. But before that, we're going to get into a bit of rebuttal. Now, this main idea that we've heard from our first half, the unsigned opposition, is this idea of the importance of influence. And what they've told us is influence comes from every single section of society. But we have to examine further from what our first half did. We need to really examine what is this influence, why is it so different as coming from the church. And we think that the fundamental difference is that religion is something that people believe in, and it's something that people put their faith in. They think that their afterlife is going to come whether they do this or this to please their God, right? We think this is the basis of several religions. But furthermore, let's look at the nature of some of these religious leaders. Now, so far we've looked at like local uh, priests and rabbis, but what happens when we look at the Pope, or the Ayatollah, or the da Dalai Lama, ladies and gentlemen? All of these major religious leaders are seen to be sp speaking the word of God, ladies and gentlemen. That means that what they say is a direct decree from God. Now, what happens when someone comes up and says, and they're the Pope, and they're like, oh, you should definitely vote for this Republican candidate, or oh, you should definitely vote for this Democrat, right? We see that essentially the people in the religion are forced into voting for this because they feel that if they do not, not only are they disagreeing with their pastor or their rabbi, they are disagreeing with God himself, ladies and gentlemen, and we think that's the ultimate harm. We think it's because they don't really get this choice and because they'd ultimately be like violating what their God wants that we think this is so harmful when we allow religious leaders to really influence people in the way they vote. Okay, then they told us this idea about secularism, and they told us we believe in the separation of church and state. We think it's a great idea. Unfortunately, we already kind of have it, so why further it, right? We think that this is false. We think that ultimately why we have a reasonable separation of church and state right now is because we've been trying it in several constitutions, in the UK, in India, in France, in America, right? We think that ultimately when we start backtracking on this, when we start letting people influence decisions, we think that as we've already explained kind of throughout this case, we think that the religious leaders gain more power, right? When they have a candidate that they've supported in power, more laws will be made. We think that when these candidates are in power, they can make laws that will in fact reduce the separation of church and state, right? Because they're being supported by the church and that's what the church would want. We think that this is a problem and we don't think that we can let cracks in our foundation appear, right? We think we need to remain a solid front of secularism and we cannot allow us to, to like slowly slip into this system where we do allow the separation of church and state to become blurred. We think ultimately they've agreed that it's important. We don't see that why they would want to risk that. Okay, with that, let's get into this final extension that we'll be bringing to you today on side proposition. We'll be talking about the war on, of religions, right? We think that ultimately in the current status quo, where we have political elections, we have it as a basis of candidates, right? We look at a Republican candidate and our Democratic candidate, or we look at like Stephen Harper versus the NDP candidate, right? And we weigh their political platforms. We say, they have this economic policy, they have this economic policy, which do I prefer, right? And it becomes about that, and it becomes about the candidate, it becomes about which party you agree with. Unfortunately, when you implement this system, what happens is we no longer have that type of discourse, right? Instead, what we have is the Presbyterian Church advocating for a certain candidate because that candidate supports gay marriage and that candidate supports abortion. Then we have another group from the Catholic Church, I'll take you in a moment, where the Pope or the leader is saying, we'll vote for this candidate because they don't like abortion and they don't like gay marriage. It becomes a war between Presbyterians and Catholics instead of Democrats and Republicans, yes. So you suggest that once we have an idea of people's religious affiliation, we'll just completely ignore every other position they have on every other issue? Okay, thank you. We think this again comes down to the nature of religion. We think that the people who are religious, who are being swayed by their pastors and rabbis, will not be focusing on economics, ladies and gentlemen. The church is going to be like, vote for this guy because he has great economics and foreign policy. No, the church is going to be like, vote for this guy because he does not support abortion, ladies and gentlemen. Sorry, but time. So what we see is ultimately it narrows the spectrum in a way. We think that people who are voting on religious affiliations will not be 
that necessarily everything in that the candidate has to present, they will not necessarily include all the facets, and this could weaken their voting decisions. We think that they're going to be swayed by people who are giving them information based on a candidate's religious affiliation instead of their actual political like skills and their political um, capabilities, and we think that's ultimately going to harm democracy. But furthermore, we think it ultimately turns our race of politics into a race of religions. We think it turns different religions against one another when their leader is saying one thing and the other leader is saying another. We think that this is not what we want. We think it creates a divide in society, and we think it ultimately turns politics into what is essentially a war of religions, ladies and gentlemen. This is not what we support.